uh, around 90 to 100 minutes. So to our speaker, which um, I hope is not too much of a surprise for you because he's um, been in the media uh, around our local area uh, for quite a bit of time now uh, and coming up with some fantastic results from his uh, citizen science uh, expeditions. So welcome Tom, Tom Christensen. Thanks so much for presenting at such short notice. I know you come from Main Bar and often work with colleague Steve Anion Smith on researching and documenting koalas with some results being featured in the local media. However, the screen is yours to give us a bit more of your background and tell us about the latest findings. Over to you, Tom. Thanks for that. <laughs> Sorry about the short introduction, uh, but I'll, no worry, I'll worry. leave it to you to um, fill us in. Okay, Thanks, I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, yeah, yeah as, as you point out, I'm friends with Steve Anion Smith and we've been poking around in Royal and Heathcote for a couple of years. Um, the COVID situation took us to a point where we were entitled to exercise together within our LGA. And we thought, well, we're better than Heathcote National Park. We were legally entitled to wander around there all day exercising. So that's what we did as a crew of two. Initially, when we started looking for koalas, we had, a few, we had a few other people along and then it sort of shut down and it was just Steve and I going out, you know, maybe three times a week, spending a day looking for koalas. Um, so we did that because it was a fun thing to do. Um, we had heard that there might be koalas in Heathcote. I, Sharon uh, Cullis had told me once that there were koalas there. She gave me a bit of a nod and a wink. I wasn't sure what that meant, but, um, you know, like all things to do with koalas, it's a lot of mystery. They're cryptic animals. They're hard to find. And initially we thought, well, you know, they're so precious. We wouldn't want to share their locations with anyone else in case people's rampaged out there to find them but we soon learned that the landscape is so vast and the koalas are so clever at hiding that you can walk around all day and not see one even if you know where it is so we set to to try to work out you know as much as we could about koalas we decided that we weren't going to look into the scientific literature we were just going to see what we could see so that we wouldn't be biased by any preconceptions of other people's work. We had been quietly told, and Sharon told me, that the area wasn't really suitable for koalas. So, you know, we didn't expect to find many, but on day one, we found one. And then we, that got the ball rolling. So Steve is heading off tomorrow on a, on a, on a cruise. He's normally very cautious about catching COVID, but he's, he's thrown caution to the wind. Um, I spoke to him this morning. I've got another talk to give tomorrow. I said, Steve, how should I handle it? He said, well, the amount of time you've got, you know, you probably, you can probably only get two points across. So I'm putting this slideshow together. I basically raided Steve's Facebook page, working backwards, pulling out images that I liked to tell a story. And I thought what I would try to concentrate on is uh, obviously koalas, but the trees that the koalas like. So, um, yeah, I'll get into it. So here, this opening shot, lovely shot of a rainbow. One way to find a koala, it's worked for us once, is to look at the end of the rainbow and you'll see a koala there in the tree. It just looks like a bit of a, I don't know, just a bit of a lump in a tree, but it's a koala. This picture here, there's one koala in there. You, you probably can spot it, it's in the middle, but you can see all those Banksia um, cones throwing you off the scent. So if you were just glancing around trying to find a koala, there's a few false koalas in there. And so finding koalas is, 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 is a, a matter of just sort of sorting the, the, the wheat from the chaff. You looking around, glancing around the trees, trying to find a blob that is too big to be up in a tree. It's not letting the light through. It could be a koala, you need to look at it. Sometimes you see a false koala in the daytime. This is not a koala, it's a possum. Just scanning the trees for koalas, you can see all kinds of things. 
So the idea is you find a koala in a tree and then you take a photograph of it. Um, so most people would probably know that this is an Angophora. You, can, you don't need to be able to interrogate it too closely. It's got those wild wavy branches. So that's a, that's a koala in an Angophora up there. The idea is to take a photograph. Once you're satisfied, you've got a photograph of the koala looking at you, you can move on and find another koala. Um, Steve's method that he taught me is to try and cover as much ground as you can. You get see as much, see as many trees as you can possibly see, and you'll probably find some koalas. When we started out, Steve was pretty confident that he wasn't missing many koalas, but it turned out we were missing a lot of koalas because they, some of them are very reluctant to be seen. So having taken your photograph, you're basically trying to get a shot of the nose. So there's two different koalas looking down, similar aspect. And you can see that the pink pattern inside the nose is quite distinct quite different. And the more koalas you see, the more variation you recognize in those um, crenulations inside the, the nose. So you get to a point where you can you can see you can see a koala's nose and you know which one it is. I'm quite, I don't think koalas identify each other that way. There are many other aspects that you could you could try to understand, but this is this is the surefire way of, of identifying koalas that we've found that works. Um, having seen over a hundred koala different individual koalas, we're pretty confident we can identify them with the nostril pattern. So just not to get too bogged down in stats, here's what we've seen what we've we've seen up to two weeks ago. 103 koalas. The almost half of those were adult females. You know, you can see there a bit over a quarter of them are adult males. And then you've got a range of joeys and and joeys in the pouch. We don't quite count those as actual koalas, but over a year we've seen them emerge and actually identify themselves as individuals. So seeing less um, adult males and females is, is not unusual. The um, adult females occupy the prime territory. We, as koala counters, know where the prime territories are. We spend more time there. The males <coughs> um, are out wandering suboptimal territories. They could be anywhere in the environment. So it's not unusual that we see less males and females, but in theory, the sex ratio is 50-50 for koalas. The other part of our results are cataloging the tree species that we can find the koalas in. So their favorite tree species is the grey gum. That's not much of a secret. Over half the sightings were in grey gums. Then you going down the list, we've got peppermints, and gophers, blue leaf stringy barks, um, the scribbly gums, then a tree called the Eucalyptus squamosa, the scaly bark. That's it's a very uncommon tree. Um, and as you work down the list, some of those are just odd trees for koalas to be in, like an Alacasurina. It's probably not feeding in there. It might be hiding. And then the at the bottom. Terita cornus pilularis. They are very uncommon trees in the area we were looking. And capitulata, not that they're common either, but they, bottom line is they like all the trees, but grey gums are their favourite. So here's a koala in a grey gum. It's just, this is the first koala that we were lucky enough to see day one sitting up way up high, you know, 20 metres up in a tree. This is a full zoom. Um, 
we're lucky enough if you look you can see its nose pattern in there. If you, if you zoomed in further, you could see the nose pattern. Um, we went out looking for koalas. I found a koala scat. We looked in the base of a tree. There was a scat lodged in the bark at the base of the tree. I said to Steve, there's got to be a koala up here. And he turned around and saw it. And so I said, Steve, let's name it after you. Unfortunately, Steve was turned out to be a female, so it became Stephanie. And this is um, this is one of the last times, if not the last time, we saw that particular koala. It had been reliably found in in one location uh, on the Warrenora River in a patch of grey gums. You could we probably saw it five times. Then it sort of moved up river we we're lucky to find it this time it was, it's in a blue leaf stringy bark um hugging the trunk um we saw it from down low on the river and then climbed up onto a cliff to get roughly at the same level of it and it was it was pretty nonplussed it, it just was very relaxed so we thought well this is a lovely sight you don't often get to look straight across at a koala so we thought we'd have morning coffee pulled out all that stuff and then we looked up to the sky and a pelican flew over. So part of our method for finding koalas was that we would always get excited when we saw a pelican. Um, we, you know, we thought we'd employ good omens as, 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 a, as, a, as a way to G ourselves along. And we called the pelican Providential Pete. Whenever we saw Providential Pete, we thought we'd find a koala. So that was quite nice to see Providential Pete and Stephanie in the one picture. And then what, out of the blue, a um, sea eagle turns up and attacks Providential Pete in the air above the koala. Providential Pete dives for the, for the lake. The sea eagle follows it down and realizes that it's not gonna be able to catch this pelican and then settles on the branch next to the koala while we're having coffee I don't think we've got photographs, but it did happen. I swear it happened. Um, it's part of our method is to um, see what nature will just throw at us. Anyway, you can see Stephanie's little nose pattern there. It's quite distinct, a little T-shaped one. Um, the mystery is where did she go? She was there for the first five times we went to this site and then she disappeared, she went somewhere else. And we find that this is quite common that koalas um, move around and you just don't find them again. So the, in the pursuit of um, nice photos, I, I thought I'd show you some nice photos first because this, this, is very un, this is very untypical koala photography out in the bush. Normally they're very indistinct. So this is a, a young, um, Joey um, sending the needle. So I've, we've, I've wandered out of Heathcote National Park at this stage, down the Warrenora River. After we'd been searching Heathcote exclusively, uh, we generated a bit of interest. Sutherland Shire Council asked us to look for koalas elsewhere in the, um, in the LGA. So this one's Marley from the needles. And you can probably, probably might be able to recognize that's a gray gum the favorite trees of koalas. These are in the blue leaf um, stringy bark. I put this photo in here to show that it's sometimes hard when you're counting koalas to know whether you've, you've seen one koala or two koalas because the joeys will hug very tight to the front usually. Most of the shots you see of, of mothers with joeys, the, the Koalas are back riding because they're sort of transporting from one place to another. But when they're just sitting up in a tree, they tend to hide in the chest, in between the arms. So it's quite often happened to us that we would see a koala and not see the joey until, you know, some time had passed. You'd, maybe we'd come back and have another look and the joey would be obvious. Quite often they're, they're well hidden. 
this is sort of more typical um, look at koalas. You just see their backsides. If you're lucky enough, you see um, two of them separated like that. So then you know that you've got a mother and child, Madeline and Bertie here in Heathcote National Park. And there, that, that would be what it, you, you, you typically look at a dad after a heavy night out that's been raining for a week there. It's, I'm told that koalas have excellent um, fur for keeping out the rain. That's why they were hunted because the, um, the fur was exported to America mainly for uh, making snowproof mitts and so forth. But to me, that looks pretty cold. So I'm just starting to show you now what, what koalas normally look like. They normally look very unglamorous indeed. Sometimes that's the best look you get out of a koala. This one we named Zelinsky because it was very close to a nuclear reactor. The, I, the, the problem is we, we can't really leave until we've seen his nose because to, t just to leave with a photograph like that wouldn't help us. The next time we saw that koala, we wouldn't know if it was the same koala. So we developed a technique to get the koalas to look at you to take a photograph. Given that they don't want to look at you, you it's best to have two people. And so you'll separate on the ground. And then the person who's, who's away from the camera might break a few sticks or sort of tromp around a little bit. And the koala will look away from that person and hopefully be uh, caught by the other person who's waiting with the camera. So it's a little sort of indirect trick to getting them to look at you. It's worked pretty well so far. We've only got a few that we hadn't been able to photograph. This is a more typical look of a koala. So I'm, I'm, sort, of, I'm sort, of, sort of heading you towards understanding what we're mainly seeing is that we're just seeing blobs up in trees. Um, this one we call Carmelo. Um, sometimes hard to get the ear of a politician. If you name a koala after them, they, 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 they're quite like that. And uh, this is Carmelo's ear. It's, pro it's possibly been in a fight with another koala. Or it may have actually had a, a tag in there. So we've, we've found um, five koalas with tags in, in the Heathcote National Park, which is quite a lot. Um, nobody knows, nobody's really able to tell us about the tags. The patch ranger were never notified of koalas being released with tags. Um, different um, koala rescue groups seem to have been releasing koalas there. And maybe that was some of the knowledge that Sharon had which she was sharing with me that she knew of released koalas. I think the assumption was that Heathcote didn't have koalas in it, so it was a good place to drop koalas off. Uh, probably not very wise. I'm sure they all went to the vet before they were released, but if they were to bring disease into the community, that probably wouldn't be a good thing. To me, that's a little bit, little, little bit sad seeing a koala with one ear disabled like that because it's got a a heavy chunk of plastic hanging off it. Um, the point of tagging koalas, I, I suppose, is so that it, if they turn up again, you know which one they were. But uh, my feeling is that you could just have a photograph of that koala's nose and that would be sufficient. So this one, uh, this koala named Hal, uh, we named after Hal Wooten, of, um, a bit of a legend in, um, conservation circles. He lived in Main Bar. Um, so the, this is, he was a very prominent koala in our, in our studies. He turned up uh, seven times and he was quite wide ranging. He would uh, move around to find uh, female koalas. So just glancing between those two photos, taken at two different times, you can, you can pretty much pick up his nose. There he's got a little um, weeping pink patch coming out of his right nostril and he's got that little dot up above. So, and he's got a little a smear across the middle of the 
the septum. And so I guess it's, um, yeah, it's a good example of, of how you can get to know the koalas. Well, I, I should uh, I, I haven't been talking much about the tree species that we're looking at. Um, if I just go back, um, he's, he's in a gray gum, I think there. Um, Elizabeth here is in a bloodwood, which is very unusual. There's so many bloodwood trees out there and there weren't supposed to be koala trees, but we ended up finding a few koalas in Bloodwoods. Orlando here is in a peppermint. These uh, photos are helpful to work out how you determine the sex of a koala. If I go back here, well, there, if you look here, you can see that uh, there's some testicles hanging down, which is very handy. That helps you know it's a male straight away, but you don't often see those. The males do also have a sternal scent gland. It's a bit hard to see here, but if you see on the right hand there, there's a little bit of a, a dark patch in the middle of the chest. That's a scent gland that the male will rub on the tree as they climb up and down to claim that tree. So there's a few telltale things about the, the males. Um, Orlando here on the right, you can see his head is very blocky. Not in aesthetic terms, they're not as pretty as the females. Um, but just basically learning to tell a sex is actually quite, um, it's quite tricky, it takes quite a lot of experience. So we had a, we had, um, a consultant, if you like, um, Jeff Francis, he's, he's been a volunteer working in conservation projects here, there and everywhere. And he's picked up a lot of knowledge about koala. So we would send him out um, photographs and he would help us um, determine the sex. Deborah and Jacqueline, um, you're starting to see koalas showing lumps at the front of them. They're, that means they've probably got joeys in the pouch. Um, I don't know if you can see, it looks like Deborah might be in a, another bloodwood. I'm seeing urn shaped nuts on that one. Um, yeah, and I'm not even sure what that one is, that tree, is it an agophora? I can't tell at this stage. It's probably, that's probably another great one. Well, these leaves are a bit of a trick, aren't they? They're not, that's not a eucalypt at all. This is some a river gum growing in front of the koalas. But that's uh, uh, Jody and Lewis. Jody was another released koala. She had a tag in her ear. Um, so had, you know, it was quite close. She's quite close to Heathcote Road. So probably I'm thinking she'd probably been hit by a car and re-released where um, she'd been taken into care um, and had gone on to have a joey. So that's a good news story. These, all these koalas that have been tagged, they, they behave more fearfully of, of humans than other ones, we think. There's another tagged koala. If you look on the right-hand picture at the back of the head, you can see a, a, a plastic tag in that ear. Um, so he's a male buck is quite different to uh, other koalas and he's so rufous. We don't know where he might've come. He might've come from a very long way away indeed. We have no idea. Perhaps after the 2019 fires, uh, people were translocating uh, koalas out of the Blue Mountains. There's no record. There's no, nobody's keeping records of these tagged koalas. This one is Maganda. Uh, we were lucky enough to find Maganda on a day that a film crew needed to see a koala. So she um, obliged and actually did a bit of tree leaping. She leapt from one tree to another tree. Um, there's been some research done. 80% of koalas um, don't climb down the same tree they climb up. They 
they make their way to another tree. So it was good fun to see her do that. If you look at the bottom of the picture, you can see the conjoined toes. Um, they're supposedly for grooming, but I think they also might help for manipulating food. I'm not sure it's on the hind leg there. Um, but they help you um, determine this when you see the scratches on the bark of a grey gum in particular, they, they leave little parallel or big parallel scratches that are quite unique to koalas. Other arboreal mammals do have conjoined toes, but none of them are so big as these. This is a male, slarty, um, in an unusual tree that in the, in the scaly bark gum, uh, Eucalyptus squamosa. Um, and in the very same tree, Patsy and Mel. So the three koalas in the one tree, um, Patsy, Nagel and Mel Keith, uh, rangers uh, who worked the, the royal areas. That was quite a treat to find them. That was not the first time we'd seen those koalas. We'd seen them earlier in, in pep, well, the mother and Joey, we'd seen them in a peppermint before. Um, and they turned up together with the male. So that was, that was quite exciting. Um, of the, I think we've, of the eight mother and Joey combinations we've seen, I think it's eight, um, they all tend to be in peppermints or in this case, in um, a scaly bark gum. The thinking is that they prefer the trees with the smaller, more delicate leaves because the joeys need to learn to eat um, effectively and starting on a small and on a trainer leaf might might be part of the reason why they they're in these trees with the final leaves. Margarita is in a scribbly gum just to prove that they do also go into scribbly gums. Um, there was some controversy about including scribbly gums into the koala sep, whether they really were koala trees, but they are indeed koala trees. In fact, it turns out that all the trees are koala trees and they have different reasons for using different trees. They prefer to be in a mixed forest with a range, like an, sort of an equal range of different tree species. They've obviously got reasons for going into different trees. Yes, the grey gum are their favourite tree, but they don't shun the other trees. Just uh, another photo of the same koala, just to show that even though you get a photo like this one, it's a great photo, to identify that koala doesn't help so much. You've got, you've got a few patches on the rump there that you might be able to match at another time, but it's much harder than looking at the, the nostril pattern, which is that's the ideal shot. And just to prove that not all the koalas are um, unglamorous, this is Zaphod sitting right out in the open at a level where you get a nice kind of a shot that wildlife photographers like. But this is very unusual. Normally it's just a lump in a tree. If you look at uh, tree trunks to work out where the koalas are, you get some bonuses along the way. Um, it's much better I think, to survey by going around and looking at everything, taking in all the information about the, the habitat, the state of the trees. In this case, the presence of a broad-headed snake. Um, that's the way we like to do it. So you go out to find koalas, you basically got to walk around and look at the, all the tree trunks, looking for the scratches as evidence of where koalas have been and how much they're enjoying that particular area. So that's a grey gum. That was on the, actually in Holsworthy, that one, but incredibly popular area. But we had to go there six or seven times before we found even half the koalas that we knew had to be there by the evidence that they were leaving. And so as well as looking at tree trunks, of course, you. Look for scat. There's a range of scat sizes here. 
they're all koala scat, except for the top one. The very top one would be a ringtail possum. It's a bit more bullet shaped. Um, the koala scats have got pointy ends and they've got discernible ridges on them. And they're a little bit finer. The, the, um, the plant matter has been masticated more effectively than, than possums do. Um, and as a bonus, if you break them open and have a, have a little smell, they will smell like eucalyptus. And possums always smell a little bit off. I have actually eaten one by mistake. It didn't taste too bad. Um, there, there are um, people who suggest uh, surveying koalas by looking for scat, like having scat sniffing dogs, and that's quite effective. But it turns out there's a range of problems with that. If it's been raining, of course, the, the scat break down more quickly, but there can be um, millipedes that eat them. So if you have a large outbreak of millipedes, you might find no scat. And I have heard that there's a wallaby that will eat them too, but I'm not sure about that. But so in some of our search areas, we found a lot of scat and, but sometimes you would find no scat at all. Um, it's, always, it's always exciting to find the scat. Technically you can log a koala into Bionet if you found the scat. You can't log them having found scratches because the scratches are just, you know, ubiquitous. So yeah, having logged them, um, they'll end up in Bionet. So we were very lucky to, to be working with National Parks. The patch ranger for Heathcote, Jody McGill, took all our data and logged it for us. It's very onerous. The system is quite hard to navigate and you have to be um, qualified to do it. Um, so, you're probably familiar with the maps. There's the Royal over there. Those very pale yellow ones, they are very old records indeed. Um, I haven't got the legend here, but every uh, square uh, corresponds to um, a year or, or a decade. And as they get paler, they're older. So all that, um, what should we call it, teal in the middle there, that's the work that Steve and I have done going out to um, Gandangaro land up the top, along the Warrenor River, some along the Georges River, uh, Sandy Point, basically koalas everywhere. Um, along the Warrenora, past the, the bridge, there's um, where we think we're finding about um, six uh, koala per, per every six hectares, and that's 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 a lot of koalas. You can see out there on the left, uh, Campbelltown, there's been a lot of work done there. The uh, koalas that we've been finding, they were traditionally thought to be, you know, uh, refugees from Campbelltown. Um, yeah, it's all a bit speculative, but my feeling is that there have always been koalas in the water catchment areas. It's just that they um, are much harder to find. Um, what else can I say? So in the middle of the uh, Royal National Park there, you see a couple of teal dots. That's um, the one that they released. Uh, Royal, the koala, there's a couple of locations for that. It's had its collar taken off, so they don't know where it is anymore. It may still be in the Royal. It may have come back to Heathcote. It can easily cover that amount of ground. Although there are a lot of koalas killed on the roads, there would be many, many more koalas crossing the road safely and um, going about their business. Okay, so the, I just put together a graph. Um, it's a bit bamboozling, but you can see along the bottom the name of every koala we ever saw and then how many times we saw it. So Stephanie, which we've spoken about, was seen seven times. And then you've sort of got all these other koalas that have been seen, you know, three or four times. But notice down the bottom, there's a range of koalas that have only been seen once. 
So these are koalas that are in the same territory as Stephanie and so forth, but they disappear from the picture. So as we move along the timeline, we start to see that we are seeing a lot of koalas once or twice. We're not seeing the same koalas over and over again. Every time we go out, if we see two koalas, the chances are that one of them we've never seen before. So this makes it quite hard to estimate the population. We thought by now we would have got to the point where we knew them all, but we keep finding new koalas. So it's very hard to guesstimate how many koalas there are. Just zooming out a bit there, that blue, electric blue area, that's the Warren or a special area. So that would be the next logical place to go looking for koalas to try and fill in this uh, map here. Anyone familiar with this um, land would know that it's it's um, water New South Wales land, but it's a special area. It's $44,000 fine if you go in. Um, if, you, if I go back to the larger koala map, you'll see that apparently there's no koalas in there. Well, very few sightings compared to around the edge. But the reality is that I'm sure that there are a lot of koalas in there. So that's what I'm looking forward to doing more work on. Um, yeah, if we can just get past this $44,000 fine business, that would be handy. Notice that that uh, is a sticker that's been put on there because it used to be 22,000. Then before that, it was 11,000. So they just keep doubling it. That seems like a good idea. Uh, you look down the bottom of the sign, it's got a National Parks and Wildlife Service logo, lovely logo. How much input National Parks and Wildlife Service have over the special area, I don't know. But I do know that there's no such thing as a Sydney Catchment Authority anymore. That was abolished. Very good idea, the Sydney uh, Water Catchment Authorities. They did a lot of good science back in the day. So yeah, the $44,000 fine, that's a bit of a problem for us. So there you have it, I am done. Questions, please. Wow, that's a, that's a terrific gift. Done a huge amount of work there, Tom. Thank you. Uh, it's it's fabulous to see, and uh, you you're really um, uh, discovering quite new things, aren't you? Yeah, hopefully so. Yeah, seems yeah. like it. Feels like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm just waiting for questions to come in. There's people. Uh, Janine, fabulous. Anything on the chat line? Oh, here's one from uh, Sophia Payne. Uh, do koalas eat lemon scented gums? Uh, Tom. Well, I would be guessing if I said I knew the answer, but they probably do. Um, whether they whether it's their preferred tree, I don't know. They will make do with a range of trees. They have their favorite trees, which have leaves that are higher in nutrition and moisture. They need to, ex they need, they prefer to extract moisture from the leaf. Um, and then you've got the issue of the unpalatability of leaves in response to grazing, browsing pressure that the tree will put out a chemical so that it might be perfectly palatable in the first hour and then maybe in the next hour, it's not so palatable. So there's, you know, it's hard to know what a koala wants to eat, but the koala knows what it wants. And koalas from different areas prefer different trees. Um, when the joey is, um, leaves the pouch, it eats a special fecal pap, which seeds its gut with particular um, bacterial biome and could be that that pap is constituted from particular species that help the koala as it grows, process those leaves in particular. Koalas in captivity are very fussy about what leaves you are brought to them. They will sort of 
reject some leaves outright and they'll eat others. So, um, yeah, the gastronomy question is wide open. I'm saying yes. They would, I'm saying they would eat them, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um, another one from Alison. Have you found chlamydia in any of the koalas? Okay, so we're not doing anything to the koalas other than taking um, photographs of them. Um, chlamydia testing requires that you take the koala out of the tree and swab it. So that's a whole nother um, area of research. There's a lot of concern about chlamydia. There's a development of a chlamydia vaccine, um, but in, you know, as a piece of medicine, it's, it's evolving. Um, there are people, you know, who, who, um, who think it's very important to attend to. And then there's other ecologists who think that perhaps it's just a naturally occurring thing or semi naturally occurring thing that we shouldn't get too upset about. Um, we haven't seen any sign of eye crustiness or um, wet bottoms or anything like that. They seem to all be healthy. Okay. Uh, a comment from uh, Zhu. Thanks, Tom, for building the knowledge. Um, another question from Janine. Are they territorial and were you able to discern specific territories? They are definitely territorial. Um, yes, so the female occupies the best territories um, and the males come to the females during mating season. Um, what drives them apart later, I don't know. There is a lot of fighting that goes on between male koalas and females. Um, yeah, they definitely are territorial. So. The size of the territory is an interesting question. What determines that? You would assume that a koala would want to have enough trees that it prefers, and possibly we think access to water. Um, it is thought by lots of people that koalas don't need water, but obviously that's physiological impossibility. Of course they need water. Um, it just might be that only in drought and heat waves they need open water to drink because they're not getting sufficient water from the leaves. So a good territory would have access to water. And that's possibly why Heathcote National Park is such a good place for koalas, seemingly, um, because it's got a permanent environmental flow from the Warren Road Dam. So there's always going to be a drink not too far away. And that's, that's, um, a difference between Heathcote and the Royal is the Royal has obviously, you know, the Hacking River, but it doesn't have a large amount of reliable fresh water, you know, that, you know, during all hot years. That could be one reason there's less koalas in, in the Royal. Mm -hmm. um, another one, are koalas affected by mange? Uh, well, yeah, good question, because the, the, the koala is, is effectively a wombat that's gone up the tree um, evolutionarily, and we know how, how much of a hard time wombats are having with mange. Um, I don't know of any mange problems around here, but I do know that you can pick up a lot of parasites if you, if you uh, lay down on the ground underneath a koala, because I've managed to get a lot of ticks so I'm pretty sure they're full of ticks. In fact, that koala that was released into the Royal National Park had to have its collar taken off because it was um, harboring ticks under the collar. Maybe that's another reason they have those little conjoined toes that can pull the ticks off. I don't know. Um, mange, yeah, good question. I don't know. Mm, okay. Uh, from Z, do you think nasal markings may change over time? Hence, only one or two sightings due to variation over time. Apologies if you have already mentioned this. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and uh, obviously, yeah, if the if the if the markings change, that would be that would present a problem. But we've got photographs of, um, you know, from one end of our study to the other of the same koala, and the markings are identical. Uh, it's not. This was not like, an innovation of ours. Like we were told that that the, the nose markings were reliable. Um, 
yeah, but we just chose to um, focus our photography on getting those nose shots. Um, yeah, and that was very good that we did that early on, I think. Okay, here's the, uh, the exciting one. Would it help you and Steve to have volunteers come and assist with koala spotting surveys in the future? There's a thousand square kilometers in the uh, special areas that I think need to be looked, we need to be searched for koalas. There's no way that Steve and I are gonna be able to do that. Heathcote National Park's 26 square kilometers. You know, it's taken a year to, get to sort of come to grips with it. Um, there's definitely a huge need for this work to be done. I don't think that there will be enough paid a koala ecologist to do the work, even if they decided that's what they're going to spend all their time doing. I think there's a huge opportunity here for volunteer ecologists to get out and do this kind of work. I would like to see that happen. I think what Steve and I have done is set up a model of how it can be done. Um, and it would be great if uh, other people were to engage in this kind of work because it's well it's 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 a lot of fun it's very enjoyable it's very valuable it's because it's so labor intensive it's hard to see any other way of doing it other than um, volunteers having said that it's quite tricky um so i'm thinking out loud here but you would need a sort of a training yeah period and then yeah it, internship or something something like that yeah the problem is, the problem is that um walking around in the bush is deemed to be extremely dangerous uh we i won't go into too much detail but land managers have suggested to us that we should survey koalas from the heathcote road because it's much safer than going in the bush in terms of insurance and uh, hazard um, occupational hazards and because of this rocks and things and you could fall over and so I know bushwalking clubs manage to insure themselves against this kind of thing but a, a volunteer ecology movement would have to cross that problem of how do we keep people safe I think we don't always stick to this but Steve and I always try to go out together so that if something happens to one there's someone to help um yeah there's a lot of safety uh, considerations i guess yeah um as so we, spotlighting um, at night for koalas have any function spotlighting at night works if you've got terrain that's you know easy but um this rocky sandstone country steep sandstone country i wouldn't want to be walking around in there at night time with a spotlight um we have tried it. Unfortunately, <laughs> the night we went out to try it, it rained 40 millimetres. Um, as soon as you get in rain, spotlighting is no fun at all. Um, no. Spotlighting does work and so do drones and all kinds of, you know, ways of finding koalas. Dogs are all more and more complicated than just going out in the daytime and using your eyes. I'm quite like going out in the daytime and use my eyes because I, if, if I don't find a koala, I'm still going to have a good time. I'm going to see a lot of interesting things. If I go out at night time, spotlighting, and I don't see a koala, it's, it's, I'm not, it's, it's not going to be a lot of fun. I, I did that when I was a, a student. Um, arboreal mammal surveys at night in, um, in forests down at Bombala, which was a lot easier ground to walk across. It was okay, but yeah i think it's more reward for people to go out in the daytime um and you learn more about the koalas because you get to assess all the trees and the state of the vegetation whereas if you're just wandering around in the dark it's 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 yeah the argument is made that spotlighting is better because you'll see more koalas but in reality you'll be constrained about where you can go so you might be drawing conclude conclusions that are erroneous and I think some of the surveying techniques uh, account for why people didn't think there would be koalas in the catchment areas because they didn't they weren't amenable to driving there in a 
you know, four-wheel drive and going for a walk. Speaking of the state of the vegetation, um, uh, another question here. I've seen trees stripped of leaves at Anna Bay at Port Stephens with a koala sitting in them. Mm. Do you know what may be going on here? Yeah, so the, it's true. If you have a koala in a pen, it will strip the leaves from that tree and then you'll have to bring in more leaves for it to feed on. But in the wild, it's unusual for a koala to do that unless it's sort of at the end of its life. In the wild, a koala is very determined to move on to the next tree and the next tree and the next tree. They, they sort of like birds. They, yes, they have a territory, but they're flitting around the place all the time. Why a koala would sit in a, in a tree and take all the leaves? Well, possibly it was afraid to come down for a reason. Possibly it was you know, at the end of its life. Um, yeah, given, given its preference, it would be moving on to the next tree. Mm, okay. Um, do you know Deb Andrew, um, Tom? I yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Deb and Brett Stevenson uh, say Deb Andrew was able to get entry to the special areas to survey for the swift parrot and regent honey eater. It mm. might be useful to talk to her about how you could gain entry to survey for koalas. Well, yes, I have, I've, I have spoken to Deb about um, these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm quite confident that, that we will get access. Um, I guess I've got a, the elephant in the room would be that the coal mining companies have a lot of say over what happens in the special areas. Mm -hmm. uh, about 80% of the special areas um, have coal leases under it with five active mines. Um, they're pretty keen that people don't find out about koalas because people might join the dots that that area is not just um, vacant land, it's habitat for endangered wildlife. Yeah. Sorry, okay. getting a bit political, but... Um, <laughs> That's all right. We're trying yeah. to do that ourselves. Yeah, so getting um, access is going to be... Um, it's doable, but it's a bit tricky. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Sonia, I see you've got your hand raised. Do you want to Yeah, unmute? yeah. Oh, oh, have I unmuted? Yeah, I yes, can hear you. Yes, Sonia. you have. Yep. Um, well, my first observation is that we're, despite the mines, we're very lucky to have all these protected areas and holes worthy so close to us. And um, as a kayaker, mm -hmm. I've paddled up Mill Creek a few times, koala yep. spotting. Yep. Um, are they visible in a particular place? Are they more likely to be in gorges or back from the river or near the river? Is there somewhere or in forest? Do they yep. have sort of a favourite place to hang out? They do. And you can see them from the kayak in Mill Creek if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty in Mill Creek area. Um, so... Steve and I will go out and we'll, you know, we've learned to, to look for grey gums. So if you learn your tree species, you know what a grey gum looks like, then you start to um, look at the bark of those grey gums and look for the scratches. And then if you find an area where there's a lot of scratches, there'll be a koala there. You may not see it the first time you go, but at some stage you're going to see it. So it's, it's, it's um, learning to search um, all that foliage quickly and efficiently is how you find koalas. If you stand at one tree and stare at it for 10 minutes and don't find a koala, um, that's not going to help you. You sort of need to be able to look at it as you're walking past it, not really stopping too much. And you just got to keep walking and looking. You could do the same thing by kayak, but, um, um, and, you're just as good a chance of seeing it from a kayak as, as you are from um, the riverbank because it turns out that koalas do prefer the riparian zone. They like to be, as yeah. I said before, close to the water, but the trees down there um, probably got higher moisture content in their foliage and they grow taller. And in our part of the world, the alluvium that deposits down at the bottom is probably richer 
um, in nutrition than up the slopes. But having said that, you will still find koalas on the benches higher up, away from the rivers. And you sometimes find them right up on the ridge. So, you know, you're a live chance to find them anywhere, but by kayak is as good as any. So if you sort of had a, a trip that you um, repeated, you, you might not see it the first time, but one day you'll see it. And I'd just like to say thank you so much for sharing this because this is, it's a rare good news story, I think. And it's just quite lovely to think that there are lots more out there. Yeah, it is. You're right. It's all good news. Um, everyone, people who who are conservation minded can 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 just draw comfort from it that, 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 that there's animals out there that are doing quite well, even though you don't know they're there. Because um, we tend to think that we need to look after each and every individual animal, but they'll look after themselves if you just leave the habitat alone. Um, and I guess too, since the fires as well, it's nice to have. Um, to know that there are some that have um, that are thriving. Yeah, and so fire, fire land clearing would be number one issue, but fire would be number two. And of course, there's a lot of anxiety about climate change. If the fire frequency increases too much, that will um, upset the population dynamics. They will come back after fire, but it's the freak, it's the interval between fires that's the problem. And to that extent, we have some control over where we're going with koalas by analyzing the way we do a hazard reduction burns. If, we, if we're doing hazard reduction burns as a matter of, just as a matter of tradition and habit, because we think it's invariably good uh, and we're not taking account of the koalas that we're killing while we do it, because we will be killing koalas when we do hazard reduction burning. Um, we lay that on top of the frequency of um, climate change induced fire you know we're heading we might be heading in the wrong direction so hopefully this kind of work will help people plan better for the way we do fire okay thanks tom um we've just got a couple of other koala issues on our plate um at the moment there's a petition to be signed in the legislative assembly of the new south wales parliament um i think saul dean um had a bit to do with writing that, getting it up. It's uh, mainly about the koalas in the Campbelltown area, but it's asking the government to um, to do four things. Um, uh, declare an Upper Georges River Koala National Park, stop the rezoning of stage two of the Gilead development and review the approval of stage one. Number three is build five effective koala crossings on Appen Road and four is implement a minimum 450 metre wide koala corridors across the rivers and creeks of MacArthur. Um, so uh, that's something that uh, I'll be putting to everybody later in the meeting to uh, get up there and, and sign that petition. Um, there's 5,000, nearly 6,000 signatures on it already. Um, do you have any... Um, you have contact with the Campbelltown people? Yeah, I, I spoke. I was um, out at Nepean Dam yesterday and spoke to Pat and Barry about that. Okay. Um, I think if, if I think if a petition reaches ten thousand signatures, um, it has to be debated. I think in the yeah, but maybe that's they've got. It. I don't know if they count online signatures for that. I'm not sure, but yeah, it didn't. You know, it doesn't. I don't know. I don't know. Petitions yeah. are a good, are a very like a lot of things. They're a good way of raising awareness. Mm. Do they actually influence planning policy? I don't know. Yeah, and the other issue is uh, next month uh, we may have um, uh, Georgia um, uh, 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 playing her uh, the trailers for her koala um, film that. Uh, she's working on. Um, so we're hoping to get her along to um, to show these trailers, the latest versions of the trailers for that um, that yeah. movie when it's eventually produced. Um, so keep that one out um, for people out there. Okay, look, that's been fantastic, uh, Tom. It's a real eye-opener. 
And I'd just like to call on um, Adrian to uh, give a vote of thanks from Oatley Forum Corner to Tom for his fantastic presentation tonight. Thanks, Adrian. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Kim? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Tom, yeah, um, super, super thanks from everybody. There's a lot of surprised people in our audience because they thought you were um, they were you you were calling in from uh, Alice Springs to talk to us about wildflowers, oh, okay. and you've stunned and you've stunned them all by talking about koalas just down the road from us. So it's been wonderful, you know. Um, first of all, be able to step in and help us out, um, and and also we've learned so much in a very short time all about koalas um, and how to identify them. Um, hopefully, you'll get a couple of um, more and a couple of us come out and, and, and maybe help you do some of the uh, surveys in the future. But it's been wonderful to meet up with you and, um, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much from everybody. Thanks, Tom. No problem. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, you're free to go if you um, stop sharing um, or you can stay on for our general business section if you like. Excellent. Excellent. I think I need some dinner. Yep, yep, I thought... Thanks yeah. for having me. It was, that's, it was fun. that's been great having you. Thanks for stepping in. Okay, we'll catch up with you later. Thanks, Tom. Okay, everybody else still with us? Okay. Um, that's a pretty hard act for you to follow, Kim. You better put up a couple of photos more of... Collapse. Yeah, any act is hard for me to follow. Any act of any kind. <laughs> Wasn't that great. fantastic? Wow. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so we've got quite a few things on the agenda for the general business. I hope I can keep you awake 